I like my eyes, but for some reason, I get a lot of compliments on my feet. Well, we know what Netgear was doing 10 years ago. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome back to Collector Car Feed. Today, I have for you a treat especial. Today, we are going to read the August 2012 issue of Super Street Magazine. Freshmaker, the Scion Racing Gretty FRS is the best of all worlds. We got Formula D, Hella Flush, and M-Fest. And not a single stock engine in here. 2JZ, 350Z, 20B, Rotary RX-7, and a K20 Civic. We got a model feature from Natalie Castillo. And the spine reads, It doesn't matter what comes, fresh goes better in life. I believe that is a Mentos reference. All right, we got an ad for the Scion FRS here. A uh, nice ad for Lambo door kits. They chose a Cavalier as their model car. Formula D 2012 featuring a Drift Jenny Coop. Where have I seen that before? Mint. All right, now here's the first piece of content in here. Whole shot, random thoughts from a random editor. When stock just isn't good enough by Johnny Wong. You come to this magazine for a reason, to find out how to make your car better, no matter what the style, horsepower figure, or end result is, just as long as it's not stock. Well, guess what? You're in luck. We like modifying our toys too. Not that any car isn't good in its original form, cough, FRS, cough, but often we find that since we won't be buying Porsches, GTRs, or other dream supercars like our peers, those entry-level platforms are just as good a place to start as any other. You just have more work cut out for yourself. This month we take a closer look at cars where the owners have agreed that stock isn't cutting it, and so their new engines have transcended beyond what the factory could offer. Some are rather unnatural, as the case with a 2JZ planted into a Nissan 350Z chassis. Others seem all too fitting, like a Civic with a K-Swap, or the Scion Racing Gretti FRS. But you'll have to read on to find out what went down in a car that's so fresh, why would anyone want to swap the engine out in its first year of production? Every enthusiast has their reason and or a dream to fulfill. Speaking of changing things up, you might notice a semi-updated look to Super Street throughout the course of the next few issues. Blah, 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 just, just a bunch of insider stuff, doesn't really matter. But yeah, that kind of gives you an idea of what's to come in this magazine, huh? Mail sack! Your letters are sackless replies. A lot of ball jokes in Super Street. A lot of, a lot of ball and dick. Is there something you want to tell us? Send your letters to superstreet247 at gmail.com, and with some luck, yours will be picked. And there's Natalie Castillo taking up the entire page, not a single piece of mail on this page. Moving on. Letters to Super Street. Model how to. I am very interested in becoming one of your models. <laughs> I have brown hair, blue eyes, and am very skinny. I love to have fun. I have been wanting to model for a long time, but just never had the confidence to do so. I am ready to do it now. I do not have any portfolio pictures, just ones I've taken myself. Please let me know if you can fulfill my dream. And Super Street replies, uh, while licking its lips, Our requirements for featuring girls in Super Street is quite simple. You must be 18 or over, we check ID, like to have fun, you love it, so add a point, and you should be pretty hot. Think you have what it takes? Hit us up at superstreet247 at gmail.com with a few photos and contact information. If we like what we see, we'll be in touch. This is the 1990s Miramax of car magazines, honestly. There are so many models in Super Street, especially in this era. Uh, you'll see. You'll see. Barbecue Disaster. I have been picking up each issue off the stand every month for a year now. I'm always looking for ideas for my project build. Well, the other night I was making some burgers and hot dogs on the grill, and I was really engrossed in your latest issue that I failed to notice all the smoke and flames. Needless to say, supper was ruined, and my, and my mom was pissed, and I was sent off to get takeout from Burger King. You're highly distracting when anything else is going on around you. Keep it up. From Constantino Stamulos via email. Our feedback, your feedback. I've been a loyal reader for 14 years, and while I hate to say this, I feel disappointed after reading the commentaries used towards some of our fellow enthusiasts in Reader's Rides. I may or may not speak for many when I say mods that should have been done is a poor way of conveying areas of opportunity. Those who share images of their car have pride, worked very hard on them, and blah blah blah. This is, a, this is an early respect all builds kind of guy. <laughs> Thanks for the mammaries. Just wanted to say I really enjoyed your last issue about your trip to Japan for the Tokyo Auto Salon. I spent quite a bit of time in Japan during my Navy days, and it was cool to read about the cool cars and unique experiences one can only find in there. One disagreement, though, the so-called Japanese beer in the U.S., imported from Canada, is quite inferior in taste to the real deal in Japan, which I'm sure you enjoyed. 
Just the opinion of a JDM beer snob. Keep up the good work. Steve via email. We totally agree. Nothing beats the taste of a Japanese beer that originally comes served in Japan. The best. Super Street. Personal opinion. Rice-based beer is disgusting. All of them. Sapporo, Kirin, Asahi. Now, that's not to say I have great taste in beer, uh, but Intel. Words by Evan Griffey. News, rumors, and stuff we made up. Scion FRS Speedster impresses. With the introduction of the Svelte FRS, Scion has the hard-hitting Halo sports car it's needed. We also see Scion as the best car maker to introduce a Miata Fighter, a zippy, well-balanced drop top with a price tag as appealing as its body lines. It seems we're not alone in this daydream. Joe Iacono of Iacono Design and Jeremy Lukowski of Cartel Customs have hit the nail on the head by taking the already awe-inspiring FRS and dropping the Speedster look on it. This wicked one-off served as the official Grand Marshal vehicle at the Long Beach Grand Prix, escorting this year's IZOD IndyCar Series raced Grand Marshal Parnelli Jones. And then they go on to describe how they made this one-off FRS Roadster. Yeah, it's great. Moving on. <laughs> Reese Millen will spend more time power sliding than driving in a straight line in 2012, as the Crafty Wheelman will be competing in two different motorsport categories this season. Uh, so we got some motorsport news, some Formula D, and uh, rally cross news here. BMWs plus boobies plus racing plus Vegas equals Imfest. Imagine 72 hours of action packed car crazy mayhem. We're talking about a full on car show, five hour caravan with hundreds of other drivers, late night drag racing, and a full day on the road course. Add in two nights of Sin City mischief, including an open bar after party at one of Vegas's hottest nightclubs, and a pool party to close out the weekend. You have the recipe for M-Fest. While it started out as BMW M owners only, the weekend extravaganza has grown to huge proportions, attracting all enthusiasts, including Benz, Porsche, GTR, Supra, and Evo owners. This year's event sold out the Hotel Palazzo as it attracted rides from all over North America, including the East Coast and Canada. Super Street had the pleasure of sponsoring Miss M-Fest contest. Of course they did. Spotting our own Natalie Castillo, oh, the cover girl, Zena Kai, and Sandra Wong as finalists. Did Johnny Wong marry one of the MFest contestants? Special congrats goes to the winner, Sandra. MFest continues to step it up every year, and we plan to visit the next event later this summer. After all, we can't turn down three days of Red Bull, alcohol, exhaust fumes, and burnt rubber. MFestForum.com. Sam Dew. Uh, some guy named Nobuhiro Monster Tajima is going to attempt an EV run up Pike's Peak later this year. That's fantastic. Tetsu's Tales. I'm not sure if this guy lives in Japan or if he's just from Japan and English is a second language or what, but um, you'll see. Super Street likes Bo Suzoku style cars, and in Japanese, the kanji characters mean Bo, Riot, So, Run, Zoku, Group. These are very low cars with wide fenders, long front bumper, and big rear wing. In fact, this style is from Japanese racing in the 80s. Super Silhouette Racing was very popular for young car guys, and this race series was following FIA's Group 5 Touring Car regulations. Group 5 race cars look like touring cars, but they are tube chassis, and looks like you put touring cars' body on formula cars. Group 5 cars are called Silhouette Formula Cars. I think the future of Silhouette Formula Cars is like the present of Super GT Racing style. Silhouette Formula Car had 570 PS turbo motor and lightweight body. They made fire from the muffler when the drivers heel towed and made the racing exciting. Nissan Skyline R30, Silvia S110 slash S12, Bluebird 910, Mazda RX-7, and BMW M1 took part in Super Silhouette Race at Fuji Speedway and Tsukuba Circuit. There were traffic jams on the expressway because so many people wanted to see the race. Many people wanted these cars, but it was hard because 570 PS was difficult to make during that time. Since Skylines and Silvias were still expensive, they chose older Ken Mary styles, Nissan Cedric Sedan, Fair Lady ZS30 or Toyota Mark II Cressida instead. They have the look of silhouette car, but tuning parts were still expensive. They cut suspension, removed muffler and catalyzer for making race cars sound. Big body with stock engine were slow, and this replica style is called Kaido Racer. Kaido means highway in Japanese. Japanese police think street racing and drifting on the street is kind of Bosuzoku style. Bosuzoku makes bad image for our people, so some people who like tuning cars don't like Bosuzoku style. 
Don't tell yams that, Johnny Wong. But in the 80s, Bosuzoku style is just one part of Japanese car life and proves that silhouette formula racing was very popular. Tetsu. Check him out at on.fb.me slash tetsus dash tails. Uh, and then we got some GTR top speed records. Uh, let's see here. This one basically just reads like an ad for some UK parts company. And this one is a story out of the Texas Mile. Some guy hit... 233.1 miles an hour on the Texas Mile in a R35 GTR. Got an ad for drag wheels. I'm not gonna lie to you, that fit looks good. Toyota goes 17 years strong. Every spring we hit up beautiful Queen Mary in Long Beach, California for Toyota Fest. Put on by the Toyota Owners and Restorers Club, aka Torque. It's not a show where you're going to find the newest or craziest project cars. It's a show built on tradition and continues to display no signs of dying as it hits an epic 17 years. The event mixes everything about the Toyota brand, whether it's old school Celicas, the later Supers and MR2s, to the newer Lexus and Scion products. It's all about the community as everyone comes together with no stress or drama. They just want to rejoice everything Toyota. While most of the cars come year after year, it was the first time many got a chance to see an FRS in person, including the sexy five-axis FRS. XDC Hot Import Nights hits the desert. The first two rounds of the Extreme Drift Circuit took place last April at Firebird Speedway with some of the nation's best and upcoming drifters. If you weren't there, you missed a ton of action as plenty of cars hit the wall and even blew up their engines trying to make it to the podium. 22 drivers competed and once the smoke settled, Forrest Wang, Stuart Leesk, and Nate Hamilton stand in the top three positions. If drifting wasn't entertaining enough, Hot Import Nights partnered with XDC to return its Night Shift show, bringing out several local AZ cars. XDC and Hot Import Nights plan to do it big in the years to come, so might be worth a look if it comes to your hood. Extreme, extreme Drift Circuit.com, Hot Import Nights.com. What Toyotas did we see at Toyota Fest here? Right off rip, top picture, I see an SW20 next to uh, something I do not recognize. Is that a Celica? I don't know. Below that, we have two Mark II Celicas, I believe. Stance to hell because it's 2012 or I guess current year too. Uh, we got a FRS, which at the time was a mind boggler because there weren't very many of them in the US yet. I think that's an LS430 next to it. And then obviously an AE86. Bottom row, we have a first gen Celica. Those are beautiful. Really up there with the S30 in looks. We got another Celica. I'm not sure what the orange thing is. That might be a Corona or something. I'm really not well versed on my 1970s Toyotas. Uh, Mark III Toyota Supra, aka the Copra, according to some of us, and next to that, a I think a President. Smackdown! Quickie, get off in two pages. Words by Sam Dew, photos by Sam Dew and Johnny Wong. The owners of this 600 plus horsepower Civic don't have a problem with you talking smack. It's pretty damn easy to think this Honda Civic is just another show car. It's super slammed and rocks a pink engine bay. But don't judge a book by its cover because it was built to win. It's not a trailer queen that only gets dusted off for shows. It's daily driven and quite possibly one of the quickest whips commuting on the streets of Honolulu. And according to the owners JR and Shelley Ordonez, the project wouldn't have even started without some encouragement from your typical haters. Years ago, I came across a picture of an EK that looked almost exactly like my car when it was still silver and just a K swap. I took that picture and posted it on the local Hawaii Honda forum because I admired it. Then, someone I always saw in cruises quoted the post, called me a poser, and said I was just dreaming. That right there motivated me, JR smiled. The next day, JR ordered all the necessary parts for boost with an AFI turbo kit for his K20Z1 motor. After installing all the hardware in his garage, he brought the car down to Seth Stubenberg from Import Dynamics to get it tuned. The resulting numbers were nothing short of amazing. 614 horsepower and 406 pound-feet, and that's with stock internals, ladies and gentlemen. Right after the tune, I brought my car off the dyno jet and had my first race that night with the guy who called me out, he told us. I just so happened to see him on the road while testing out the car. You can already guess the end result. Yeah, everybody clapped, right? <laughs> JR continued to tell us that he likes toying with any car that thinks they can stomp on his Civic, even motorcycles. Because the island of Oahu has no racetrack, he takes advantage of races on the few quiet strips of highway and industrial roads when he can. JR concluded, Having haters is a good form of motivation. To the haters, keep drinking that hater aid. <laughs> I heart haters, am I right? Still comfy for daily driving even with the Cusco roll cage and Recaro seats. I 
don't believe you. Three, two, one, drift off. Scene, Formula D, streets of Long Beach, Long Beach, California. Words by Sam Dew, photos by staff. If you've never been to Formula Drift, what the hell are you doing with your life? Maybe we're a little biased, but it's something everyone should experience at least once. Where else can you see a pair of high-performance cars sliding in tandem speeds at 60-plus miles an hour only inches from cement walls? We know there are plenty of haters to drifting. It's not for every car guy, but over the last 10 years it's become recognized as part of American motorsports and continues to gain popularity around the world. And perhaps no other track draws as much excitement and attention than the streets of Long Beach. While other rounds of Formula D are held on proper road courses, round one takes place in downtown Long Beach just a week before the IndyCar and American Le Mans series. So last April, the ninth season of FD kicked off with a sold-out crowd and 60 of the world's top drifters, which included 19 eager rookies. The season opener didn't disappoint us, with plenty of epic battles and upsets. In fact, the final two standing was a rematch between last year's reigning champion Dai Yoshihara against second place finisher Justin Pollack. JTP defeated Chris Forsberg and Matt Powers on the way to the finals and eventually knocked Dai on the last match. This is the second consecutive win for JTP at Long Beach, but with plenty of superb drivers in the field, it's going to be a wild season this year. Other crazy happenings include the introduction of Daigo Saito. A no-namer to many spectators here, but he's a powerhouse overseas as the 2011 FD Asia champion and also a former D1 GP title holder. After defeating Reese Millen and Matt Powers in Long Beach, he took third place losing to Dai Yoshihara. Is the Dai vs. Dai battle a sign of things to come? We sure hope so. We'll have more news from each round, but if you haven't already, look up this year's schedule and get your asses to Formula D. Uh, center of the page here, Slam Society. The Slam Society showcase is an added bonus to FD. When you're not watching the action, take a spin through the car show to see plenty of stanced rides. For more info, check fatlace.com slash showcase to see if it's coming to your hood. Heavy metal! Meet one of the baddest FC Mazdas to roam Middle Earth. Words, Brad Lord. Photos, Alastair Ritchie. In this day and age, cooking up an original recipe for a tough car is something much easier said than done. While there are limitless ways to modify a car, bringing something fresh to the table is never an easy task. But by marrying the best bits of several different performance automotive subgenres, including drift style and drag racing performance, 23-year-old New Zealander Aaron Keach has done just that with his 1988 FC3S Mazda RX-7. The result is Slam It, one of the toughest JDM imports rolling on Kiwi roads. Right from the very beginning when the RX-7 was stock and very rough, getting it to look just right was something high on Aaron's priority list. I knew I wanted to run a body kit, but it took me a long time to decide exactly which one, he says. By the time I eventually settled on a BN sports kit for the bumpers and side skirts, I had also made the decision to go wide, so it took me even longer to find the right fenders. By the time the car was ready to paint, Aaron had picked up a pair of fattened D-Max fenders for the front end, but was still at a loss for what to do in the rear. The guy charged with the bodywork side of the equation, Grant Walker at GT Refinishers, had the perfect solution, however hand build them from steel to Aaron's personal specification. The desired look was pulled together with a custom-crafted drag-style rear wing before the whole car was painted hot rod style in PPG satin black. The overall result is simple, but extremely effective. Yup, that's a completely ruined RX-7. You did it. I like the equips, though. Like the exterior, when it came to the interior, Aaron didn't want to overcomplicate things. He describes the cockpit as raw, and it's a pretty accurate description. A full roll cage, two race seats and harness belts, a nardy steering wheel, and a Willwood pedal box is pretty much it. A few... Defy? Is it Defy or Defy? I think it's Defy. Tell me if I'm wrong. A few Defy meters were thrown in, but there's no dashboard, no carpets, and no speedometer. If you know how fast you're going, you get scared. Aaron says, speaking of the ladder, <laughs> So I solved that problem by simply removing it. The other key prerequisite was to ensure the RX-7's bite was as big as its bark. In other words, with such a staunch outward appearance, Aaron wasn't going to settle on anything less than utter overkill between the front strut towers. And he found exactly what he was looking for in a wild 3-rotor 20B package courtesy of local rotary specialist Curran Brothers Racing, or CBR. Brent Curran, the brains behind CBR, isn't only one of New Zealand's most talented high-power rotary engine builders, 
He's pretty handy behind the wheel too, having pointed his own car, a methanol guzzling 20B triple turbo powered 71 Mazda RX-2 coupe to a 6.99 second, 196.99 mile an hour pass on the strip. If that's not testament to his tuning powers, then the monster lurking under the hood of Aaron's car certainly is. A CBR drag spec 13B engine initially found its way into the RX-7, but along with a few setup issues, that proved a little too peaky for the street. It was pulled only to go on and power Brett's RX-2 to a seven second quarter, and replaced with a milder 20B package. In reality, however, it's anything but. Beginning with a genuine 20B block, CBR enlarged the factory intake ports to bridge port specification, fitted FC3S Series 5 rotors complete with race-grade 2mm apex seals, as well as lightening and balancing the eccentric shaft, and modifying the stationary gears. Suitably specced, Brent then set about formulating a forced induction system of serious proportions based on Aaron's requirement for big power with reliability. At the heart of the setup is a Borg Warner S400 turbo with a tile wastegate for boost control. A large custom pipe front mount intercooler was factored into the equation along with a bespoke Frank Wig fabrication intake and 4 inch exhaust system kicked off through a 5 inch turbo downpipe. Fueling the fire necessitated the use of some equally serious gear, including a Carter lift pump, twin Bosch Motorsport 44 fuel pumps, an SX fuel pressure regulator, and six high flow injectors feeding off custom rails. A Microtech LT16 engine management system gives the firing orders. For street duty, around 12 psi of boost has been dialed into the equation, resulting in a dyno proven 550 horsepower at the rear wheels. According to Brent, there's a lot more capability in the current setup, and with 20 psi of turbo-generated pressure forced through the block, he's adamant the engine would push over 800 horsepower to the treads. To handle the power, a quartermaster twin plate clutch is employed, but impressively enough, the rest of the driveline is pretty much factory fare, save for a lightweight Cromali flywheel and a Mazda Speed LSD equipped rear end. As we all know, wheel choice can make or break the deal. And from the moment Aaron decided to build the car, he had his mind made up on a set of classic work equips. But finding a set in the right size and fitment proved to be a lot harder than he imagined. And seeing as work wheels had discontinued the model from its lineup, he took the next best option and ordered a brand new set of three-piece Meisters measuring 19x9 and 19x12. The wheels sufficed for a year, but the moment a set of used equips came up for sale, Aaron didn't let the opportunity pass him by. At 18x11 and 18x13, the fat equips fill out the fenders nicely, but out the back, a pair of custom-engineered arms were required before the rear pair would physically fit. I do hate stance. I will admit that looks badass. <laughs> To achieve the desired squat and tighten up the 24-year-old car's handling prowess, the rest of the suspension system got an overhaul too. Together, D2 coilovers, custom toe arms and camber links, and a full course of performance-grade nolathane bushings go a long way in taming the FC's tendency to do everything but drive in a straight line when the engine comes on full boost. Plenty of hard graft and equivalent of 75 grand is what it took to turn a rough stalker into the sinister-looking weapon of mass induction before you. But Aaron isn't complaining. The best thing about this build was the people I met along the way and the close friends I have gained from it. Plus, after being broke for five years, I can now enjoy the result of all the hard work. If there's one thing I learned along the way though, it's that cutting corners and rushing into things really does end up costing more in the long run. There's a lot of truth to that old saying, do it once, do it right. Although there are no immediate plans to modify the RX-7 further, when it does eventually happen, Aaron says the upgrades will revolve around a revised suspension system, fresh paint, and a spattering of carbon fiber. Oh, and a new engine package too, because this one will soon be finding its way to his new project, a 77 Mazda RX-3 four-door sedan. If Mr. Curran Brothers Racing has his way, when that happens, they'll be turning the wick all the way up too. But that's another story. Uh, over here we have a classic ad for XXR wheels, all the terrible classic designs of the 2010s. Moving on. Yikes, safety first. Debbie and Maya show us today's best strap-ins. Before you rip the next four pages out and post them on your wall, we do have a message here. Well, you know me very well, Super Street. This month, instead of bringing you a random list of new parts to look out for, we had our friends Debbie and Maya showcase the top five safety harnesses you'll need before heading to the track. The belts photographed here are perfect for every application, from a casual weekend warrior to a dedicated race car. Featuring three inch wide straps and a cam lock buckle, 
these belts meet tech inspection for 99% of the tracks out there. Yeah, I would love to daily drive a car with fucking cam lock Super Street. Okay, now you can rip these pages out or visit superstreetonline.com for more outtakes of Debbie and Maya. Strap for straps, thanks to Moto Vicity, Moto, Moto Vicity? We'll be giving away a set of race quit belts to one lucky reader. To win, all you have to do is blah blah superstreet247 at gmail.com. Uh, Crow Enterprises, Takata, of course, and then of course, uh, Sparko 4 point and a race quip 5 point. Uh, full page ad for Racelands. <laughs> Ew. And another feature article by Johnny Wong. Photos by Sean Klingelhofer. A whole lot is something from nothing. Custom built from the ground up, literally, the Scion Racing Gretty FRS is ready to show the world what it can and will do. It's hard to believe that this car was once just a bare chassis with only body panels, says Mike Chung, planning manager at Gretty Performance Products, when speaking of how their FRS project came to be delivered at their doorstep. No engine, suspension, not even a subframe. That's how bare it was. It quite possibly could have been one of the first FRS chassis in the US predating even the pre-production models, but still far along the process from the camouflage test mule you've no doubt seen on the internet. That's if you've been chronicling the entire 8.6 FRS development process from concept to showroom ready models. But here it is, finished, if not totally dialed in, ready to head to the war zone we know better as Formula D. Gretti has had a long-standing relationship with Scion, having built several cars over the years, the first project being a first-generation XB that was actually built in conjunction with Super Street back in 2004. In more recent years, Gretti has had a successful TC road racing venture. With the FRS, Scion had a new game plan in mind, to place the talents of their young star Ken Gushi, the former driver of a Drift TC, now Tony Angelo's, uh. within the capable hands of Gretti's R&D team to see if magic could indeed be made. The chassis was delivered to Gretti in June of 2011 and by December had custom fabricated all of its components for shakedown testing at Laguna Seca. Even our friends at Motor Trend had caught all of it on film and posted it for the world to see. However, none of those one-off parts were legal according to Formula D's rulebook. And really, the testing was meant to see how and if the drivetrain could hold up. And so, Gretti went back to the drawing table. It gave them only a short window of time to wait for an actual factory subframe and Formula D's 2012 rules to come in. Yet a competition spec version couldn't be completed until after its world reveal debut at the, De at the Detroit Auto Show at the end of January earlier this year. Ah, right, the drivetrain. Here's where things get interesting. As you can probably guess, this isn't the FA20 that's supposed to come in a stock FRS. Remember, the chassis came without an engine. We would have developed parts for the FA20, but we only had one engine to work with from the get-go, says Mike. This is the reason why we chose the EJ25 as an alternative, and surprisingly, it's a close bolt-in. The FA20's transmission doesn't bolt up to the EJ, so it requires a different bell housing, which we found through companies that offer custom bell housings for sand rails. As far as whether or not they think the EJ swap will be a viable option for FRS owners, Gretti says it's not the easiest job as it requires quite a bit of custom work to make it work like butter. Mike adds, size-wise, the EJ, it works, and the mounting points are similar, but the smaller details are more than a weekend job and exact machining will be required. The joint effort between Toyota and Subaru is ultimately what makes up an FRS's DNA, and so it's cool that the EJ25 can be used almost effortlessly. Cosworth helped build the team's engine with specifications supplied to several rally teams, nothing special than what's offered standard. Eventually, we will go back to the factory engine, Mike adds, more likely next year than this. This year is more of understanding our team's dynamics, and we relied on Cosworth so we could concentrate more on preparation and not lose valuable time on engine development when we could have set our car up properly. Furthermore, on Gretti's end, they custom fabricated their own exhaust system and intercooler piping to a V-mounted R-spec intercooler bolted to an off-the-shelf TDO6 SH25G turbo. Tuned with a Cosworth EC Pro engine management, it puts down a generous 600 horsepower with 500 pound-feet. A car can't be built without its driver in mind, and so Gretti built the car around Ken as if it were his own personal car. From the seating, pedal positioning, and more, he was involved every step of the way. His feedback is clearly crucial to help dial the car in, which was very important during development as several problems occurred during shakedown. Doing everything from scratch is the hard part, Mike explains. There isn't another car like this out there, so everything's new. We couldn't compare it to anything. The good part, since it's a mixed build of Toyota and Subaru parts, is that it allows for the flexibility of applying parts that are similar. 
One example they gave us were drivetrain issues. Breaking axles is expected, but finding replacement parts is problematic, especially since they couldn't go to a dealer and source new ones. By using both Toyota and Subaru components, Gretti was able to create a beefier hybrid axle. They add, when we pulled everything apart, some things were labeled Subaru, but they're Toyota spec. We could really see how the two companies work together. Gretti didn't have to spend a lot of time working out the kinks in the suspension department, mostly because the car is pretty much good to go right out of the box. According to Mike, he says it's pretty clear that both manufacturers spent a lot of time to make sure the arms and suspension geometry were on point, and that it's not tough to make a competitive drift car. They only added in KW Club Sport coilovers and stiffened the chassis with a custom roll cage. In regards to the FA20, however, they are working on parts development and you can expect a turbo kit in the near future, both for off-road and street use. Turbocharging the FA20 isn't as easy as the WRX or STI, they say. The configuration is different. Where the turbo would normally be positioned is where the FRS's ECU and main engine harness is. As for the future of the Scion Racing Gretti FRS, with round two of the 2012 Formula D season about to start as of press time, we can be sure the road to victory won't be entirely clear of obstruction but the signs are looking great. Gretti is quick to point out that Ken Gushy is very focused and everyone's positive and excited to have a shot at winning and a spot on a podium. We want to give him that opportunity the best we can. The car is using everything that Toyota, Scion, and Subaru has in their powers to provide, and Gretti has stepped up massively to take advantage of the opportunity. Gretti is also working on a second FRS to help showcase more of what they can do with the FA20 and in both NA and turbo form. But the key point is that Gretti is doing what it can to succeed, saying, One key thing is that the entire car was built in-house at GPP with only two R&D techs. We spent a lot of hours on this, so it's a testament to us as to how well the car did at its debut at Long Beach. Making the top eight is good for us. We couldn't shoot too much higher. Ken's getting more comfortable with the car and is pushing it more. His confidence is something that will pay off in the long run for sure. New Car Joyride Follow-Up 2013 Scion FRS Announcing Garage FRS By the time you read this, the Scion FRS will have long debuted in limited numbers across the country and no doubt will, unfortunately for you, be long sold out. I say this because the prophecy has already come true. The First 86, a program devised by Scion to give the lucky First 86, literally, who signed up on their website to purchase an FRS, went down a smashing success. Those owners have been posting happily on Facebook since receiving ownership of their new car. I have taken my second turn at driving an FRS, a final production model, for more than just a few laps at a private track. And if you were wondering, it reaches a top speed of 130 miles an hour without breaking a sweat. Don't ask how I know, just believe me. So it should come as no shock that the car is doing what Scion has always said it was going to do. Give the masses an affordable sports car that us, the enthusiast, would enjoy. Enjoy it? Shit! We love it. Let me tell you why. And don't worry about which poison you choose. Both the manual and auto drivetrain configurations are sublime. Gross! But don't feel like the manual is the end-all be-all here. As I've stated before in my initial drive, see New Car Joyride April 2012, which I believe I have over here, guys, if you're interested. It's so much fun to drive in automatic. Jesus, super straight. Select sport mode, let the car take over control, Press the gas and go. With 200 horsepower on tap, realize that this is plenty of power. We're talking 100 horsepower per liter from the 2 liter FA20 Boxer. It winds up nicely through each gear. And since the engine's mounted low, the car's lowered center of gravity suddenly becomes equal or greater to some of the world's supercars. Naturally, you'll want to keep it in sport mode at all times, but maybe you'll reconsider the idea of throwing friends in the back seat for a ride along because it is cramped despite 2 plus 2 seating. The FRS drive can't be told in simple words alone. It must be experienced firsthand, which is exactly what Toyota's engineers have long been promoting. Get in one, drive the shit out of it, then come back and beg for more, like we did. Again, we're calling it love at first drive here. Aside from that, the final production FRS is pretty much what I expected in Japan, except this time I got to check out the bespoke audio system, which is the brainchild of Pioneer's Zipper program. Connect your iPhone, sorry, it's only compatible with that at the moment, and you'll be able to access Facebook, Twitter, and internet radio stations, and more through a touchscreen. Really cool. 
Oh, and if you're curious about the aftermarket, then suit up for this exciting news. Together with Import Tuner and Modified Magazines, we're teaming up to build the ultimate FRS project, dubbed Garage FRS. I don't know if you can make this out, I am shooting this on an Android phone. Um, if I do this again, I will definitely use something better. Garage FRS, Garage FRS. They're separated by a period, yet nobody bothered to do any sort of checking on this and make sure that they match. Garage FRS is everything Scion FRS, the ultimate enthusiast online haven for lovers of this car. GFRS calls all the latest and greatest FRS news and views, links the car to its inspirational forebears, and shows why the platform should be regarded as one of the best performers of this or any era. GFRS will feature articles and posts from iconic tuner publications like us, that's Super Street, Import Tuner and Modified Magazines, in addition to a large helping of original content as well as anywhere on the web, shining a light on FRS tuners, social gatherings, and other related events. The portal's text section provides a deeper understanding of what makes the FRS so athletic and an ideal candidate for tuning, with product previews and profiles, road and dyno tests, and culminating with a build of GFRS and Project FRS. It goes on. Um, you can win $10,000 in parts through a giveaway on their FRS website, which, you know, honestly, I'm not sure if they even mentioned the, the website on this page. Be sure to bookmark Garage FRS when it launches July 16th. Here's what became of centerfolds. By 2012, they had stopped doing the trifolds, I guess, and you just get a couple full-page pictures that you can cut out with your scissors. <laughs> uh, let me see if I have one. Hold on a second. A double-sided... Trifold centerfold. Look at that scion. Good God. Uh, we got a model spotlight. First date with Nate. Natalie Castillo isn't your average model chick that poses in front of a camera every day. She's a professional woman, a financial analyst to be exact, aka math nerd. She also bartends and models on the side. We caught up with the half Filipina, half Irish girl last April in Vegas as one of the finalists for Miss Imfest. It was also her first time in Vegas, so we did our best to photograph and interview her while she was half sober. Yikes! Enjoy the feature here, but also visit her fan pages and give her a warm welcome to the Super Street family. Blah, blah, blah. Her go-to drink at the bar is a shot of Jameson. Her current car is a Jeep Cherokee Sport, and her dream car is an R34 GTR more than the R35. It's just so sexy. Favorite body parts on your men and yourself? I like nice arms and stomach on men. I like my eyes, but for some reason, I get a lot of compliments on my feet. Creepy, maybe? Ha ha. Well, we know what Netgear was doing 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, wow, full page ad for Harbor Freight. Remember when Harbor Freight was the shit? Remember when you could go to Harbor Freight and they would just give you a multimeter and 20% off of anything else you bought? Mahalo, words by Sam Du. Scene, Hella Flush, Hawaii. Ward Village Shops, Honolulu, Hawaii. Hawaii shocked the scene last year. Not just a destination, <laughs> not just a destination for tropical weather, local food, and of course, beaches and bitches. The car scene is also strong. Enthusiasts are dedicated in growing as more youngsters are getting into the tuning game. On the small island of Oahu, the stance movement is one of the biggest trends right now, especially with the absence of a racetrack. So for the third year in a row, the Fat Lace produced show Hella Flush returned, bringing out support from the entire island, including VIP rides, drifters, Euros, and trucks. Hella Flush was a sweet success, and we'll be checking back into Hawaii to see what kind of crazy rides they're building. Also, stay tuned for more Hella goodness when the show series hits Japan, Australia, and more this year. What we got? Ronson Barrett's EG with SSR Mark 1s and plenty of Benjamins layered into the shaved B16A turbo engine bay. Rack Civic, bitch. It looks like he stuck a bunch of $100 bills in the engine bay and cleared them in. Then we've got a hardtop S2000, a Scion IQ, a EK Civic Coupe, I think, on what looks like Diamond Racing Steelies, some STI, a Blob IWRX hatchback, a stanced shopping cart, and a Hawkeye. Very cool. New car joyride, 2015, nope, try again, bitch. 2012 Fiat 500 Abarth. That new car smell, 2012 Fiat 500 Abarth, starting from 22 grand with a 1.4 liter multi-air turbo engine. Woo! Words by Johnny Wong, photos courtesy of Fiat. By the way an Abarth fires up, you wouldn't expect a car this small can make a noise that big. 
In a standard model Fiat 500, I imagine being pointed and laughed at, but in the A-Barth, they'll point, laugh, and somehow manage a violent succession of thumbs up as if your name was Skrillex, and you had just, quote, dropped the bass. That's how shockingly entertaining and fun this car is to drive. In a time where smaller cars are becoming a popular option for young urbanites, the Italian-bred Fiat 500 Abarth comes in not only to join the cool crowd, but to step in as peacocking alpha male. All thanks to the Abarth legacy that helped drive the Fiat brand in its early years. It didn't hurt that they put out a mega viral Super Bowl commercial featuring the ultra babelicious Cartanel Mingia to help get the promotion going. The Abarth name is more than just a premium edition 500, however. The name carries an impressive racing legacy thanks to Carl Abarth, the man who helped transform the original 500 into a winner, literally, by developing parts under the Abarth and C division. To spare you any deep details, just know the man has 10,000 individual race victories, 10 world records, and 133 international titles to his name. Needless to say, tweaking cars to make them perform their best was his mission. Modern day Fiat uses the Abarth spirit to create this, and we're sure it would be something he'd be proud of. Obviously, the Abarth sets itself apart with more aggressive styling cues over the standard Model 500. It's certainly more aerodynamic with a front end that not only looks great, subjective, but serves as an aid to the turbocharged multi-air motor with intakes to draw in plenty of air for intercooler performance and engine cooling. The side profile shows off Abarth spec graphics and side skirts while the rear bumper completes the look with twin tailpipes. It's a clear night and day difference between this and the standard 500, like a before and after shot of someone in a hydroxy cut ad. Inside, it's a bit cramped for space. You won't be hauling furniture home from Ikea or more than one extra person in the back seat. The Abarth comes with cool little interior touches like a boost slash shift light combo gauge on the steering column, something you'll enjoy winding up from one stoplight to the next and we did a lot. This car was so fun to drive, it reminded us of a Dodge SRT4. Similar exhaust note, rumbly and almost too loud at times, yet packaged infinitely sexier. Besides, girls always smile at you if you're in a Fiat. In the SRT4, you'll be lucky if anybody looks at you without shaking their head. What can you expect if you're one who can't leave a car stock? Fiat has you covered. Through its US connection to Mopar, you'll have access to factory-supported performance accessories. If you crave more of a European vibe, you can also opt for the Euromarket parts, as demonstrated on Fiat's one-off Venom 500, which sports Magneti Morelli Edition components, including carbon fiber body parts, boost controller, Bomberdone exhaust, and 17-inch wheels, just to name a few. Parts interchange easily since this is a global release, and with a little Im imagination, the right combination of parts, as the Venom 500 shows, even your little Abarth can inch up to the 200 horsepower mark. Not bad for the little guy. Staff thoughts. I have a confession to make. I like driving the Fiat Abarth. But I do have my reservations. The few days I took it home, I was getting more attention than most of the modified and new cars I've driven. Perhaps the only other experience when I had people turning heads and pointing at me all the time was when I drove a Gallardo. But back to the car, this little Fiat is an attention getter, especially in white. While it only packs 160 horsepower and 170 pound-feet into a small turbocharged motor, it gets up and around in a hurry. It also sounds bossy with a prominent turbo spool and burbly exhaust note. Not intentionally, but I set off a few car alarms in a parking structure. Power does die off towards the top end, but perhaps some software upgrades down the line can fix that. The hardest part about loving this car to death is the mere size and design behind it. Most people don't look at the car and say, badass. It's cute, regardless of the Abarth name or not. I'm also not the biggest guy, but even for my size, I found the interior to be too tight. In fact, when Jonathan and I sat in the front seats, it felt like we could bump elbows. At the end of the day, though, it's a nice package for its price. If you're looking for something that packs a punch, this is the car for you. And then we have one from Bernice. I have two words to describe the Fiat Abarth. It's zippy and cute. This car is a total guy magnet. Ha! It did get a lot of attention on the road. I'm not sure if it was because of the loud engine coming out of such a small car or the white on white exterior, I could have done without the graphics. The car handled really well, is definitely roomy enough for a couple and maybe a dog in the back seat. Sacrilege! Words by Sam Du, photos by Matt Jones. This Nissan doesn't have your typical engine swap. What Stephen Mills does for a living might sound like a bore to you. The 30 year old is a quality control manager and inspects metals sent to chemical plants in Southern Texas. Yawn. But his passion for modifying cars is far from boring. After building many trucks and five show cars, he's embarked on a six year journey with this 04 Nissan 350Z. 
On the outside, it looks like a pretty decent coupe with a Nings Plus One body kit, custom pearl paint, and aggressive green wheels. But what caught our attention most is under the hood, a 2JZ swap. Now the big question, why? To our surprise, Steven had already pushed Nissan's VQ35 to the limit, dropping more than $10,000 on a twin turbo build. I was kind of disappointed with the power though, he told us, and one day screwing around with nitrous, I lifted the head on the motor. It was back to the drawing board and I wondered what I should put in, an LS or an RB. But I decided let's be blasphemous and put a 2JZ in. In 2012, or like probably 2011, 2010 when you built this, why not just get a Mark IV Supra? I know the answer is show car. But, ugh. Staggered 19-inch ISS forged wheels are painted green from the Lambo color palette. Perfect pair of bride carbon buckets with Takatas. Show car status with a full stereo featuring JL gear. So with a crazy idea and some money to throw around, okay, a lot of money, Steven hit up the most experienced swap gurus in the business. Tech 2 Motorsports from Redding, California. No stranger to Super Street, we featured Tech 2's 2JZ swapped S13 in the May 2007 issue. They also completed a few 2JZ swap 350Zs in the past, one notably displayed at the 2008 SEMA show. So with the right people on board for the project and a group of friends to help with the labor, all the necessary swap parts were shipped to Steven, which included the motor mounts, cross member, transmission member, drive shaft, and shifter extension. Tech 2 also supplied the appropriate intercooler, radiator, and certain plumbing components for the project. Back home in Texas, Steven was able to source a healthy motor from a 98 Supra, which was then converted to a big boost and single turbo setup for more power. Then, with the help of a buddy, he pulled the old VQ and shoehorned the 2JZ into place without any major headaches. Another close friend helped modify the wiring harness while a third-party shop fabricated a custom downpipe and some other turbo piping to ensure the Toyota motor fit perfectly. Finished off with an HKS exhaust, new oil cooler fuel pump, and a handful of other accessories, Steven was ready to shock the nation. The car is drivable thanks to basic software maps from AEM, but Steven admits the car isn't 100% yet and he's not confident the current tranny will handle the abuse. But once those concerns are fixed, the motor shouldn't be a problem hitting 700 horsepower. The rest of the Z has all the right gear to look and handle right. It's equipped with some gritty goodies such as the Type S coilovers and front and rear brake kits. The interior is also looking proper with bride seats, keys, steering wheel, and a Cusco cage. While a stronger tranny is installed and the engine fully tuned, Steven plans to show it at SEMA and also take it to the Texas Mile Race in hopes of breaking a 200 mile per hour standing mile. We admit that most of Nissan and Toyota purists hate this Z, but at the end of the day, Steven wanted to be different and have as much reliable horsepower to his disposal as possible. What else better than the tried and true 2JZ? And on the next page, we have an advertisement for the pride of the Philippines, Rhoda, the art and science of wheels. Tech support, where we cure all your tech problems. Here's where we act like we know something technical about cars. Feel free to ask us about your technical troubles. Write us at superstreet247 at gmail.com or mail us. Beg to differ. I own a naturally aspirated 93240SX that has a K24DE with a non-turbo Z32 differential. I'm looking to change the diff ratio to 408. My car is daily driven and driven hard on occasion if weather and traffic conditions permit. I spend a significant amount of time on the highway, so I'm looking to reduce my RPMs from 3,800 to about 3,000 when I'm at 65 miles an hour. I don't know if I should go lower or higher based on the ring and pinion. What do you guys recommend? And Super Street answers, calculating gear ratios is easier than many people think. All you'll need is a tire diameter, a vehicle speed, a desired RPM, and the car's transmission overdrive ratio. Then search the internet for a differential gear ratio calculator and plug in your numbers to come up with an ideal gear ratio. We're a little confused. First, the Z32 non-turbo came with a 408 gear ratio, so changing to a 408 won't change anything. Second, 3800 RPM at 65 miles per hour sounds pretty high. You might want to check to see if you're running a proper tire diameter before playing with your gearing. As for an inexpensive option for the R200 differential, the 97-01 Infiniti Q45 had a 369 ratio, which might work for you. Swap options. I recently bought a 88 Mazda RX-7 FC and plan to change the engine, but I'm a bit worried about the choice of engine. I first plan to swap the non-turbo 13B for an SR20 DET, which is a swap that has already been seen. Some have told me that it would be easier to swap a 13B Renesis or a 4AGE in. Is the Renesis motor reliable? What about the 4AGE? That's an AE86 engine. But that just doesn't seem to make sense. 
What setup would give my FC the most potential? In terms of most potential, it's difficult to beat an LS V8 swap. If you want more bang for your buck, the Ford 5.0 is a great alternative. We don't need to read the rest of this. <laughs> Old or modern? I have a 72 240Z project car. Everything's sorted out except for the engine. The L24 is nice, but I'm really interested in the RB26 DETT or an L28 ET, which of course is a very common swap for an S30. What do you think is better out of the two? The fuck kind of questions are these? <laughs> Without skipping a beat, Super Street responds, although the term better is subjective, from a performance standpoint, the RB26 is clearly superior. Straight out the box, you get a dual cam head, twin turbos, individual throttle bodies, an underrated 280 horsepower, and an 8K redline. With a few bolt-ons and some added boost, you'll be pushing 350 wheel horsepower without even stressing the engine. But this comes at a baller price as these engines go for a premium, especially two weeks before race wars. Additionally, a rear wheel drive transmission, RB25 DET or modified Z32, custom custom rear sump oil pan, a mount kit, custom wiring, upgraded fuel system, and a custom intercooler setup will all be needed. If you want more of an old school look and can appreciate what the L series has to offer, the L28 ET is still a good choice. It really boils down to what you like and how much you want to spend. RB for S13. I have an S13 chassis 240SX and I want to swap the RB26 DETT in. Which rear end axles do I need to complete the swap? Who on fucking earth is asking Super Street these questions? instead of just going to Zilvia. What are you fucking doing? Most people use the RB26 DETT engine mounted to an RB25 DET rear wheel drive transmission and the stock 240SX differential and axles. On a street car, the stock 240SX differential and axles hold up fine because the tires spin before the parts start breaking. With purpose-built drag cars, the axles are the first to go. The good news is that companies such as driveshaftshop.com offer beefy axles for these type of extreme applications. The stock differential is quite strong. Most racers simply replace it with a stock one in the rare event that it fails. Break it down. I have a 2006 Nissan Sentra SER based Spec V without the Brembo brake package. I recently bought the spindles, calipers, and discs off an 05 Altima SER and it converts my four lug to five lug perfectly up front, but I can't seem to find the right parts to convert the rear. Do you know which parts I'll need? I forgot that the Altima SCR existed. I'm gonna be looking at those here in a minute. We're not Mike Kojima, but the last we heard, there isn't a direct fit five lug hub that fits to the B15 rear spindle. The next best thing is to purchase a sleeve and spacer kit, which allows the 90 to 99 maximum rear hubs to bolt to the existing rear spindles. For more detailed information on this conversion, check out the center forums, such as b15u.com and sr20forum.com. Organize your garage and workspace with these helpful tips. Tool Academy with Marissa Hiroko. Words and photos by Sam Du and Johnny Wong. Jonathan Wong never misses an opportunity to photograph a model, does he? It's easy to let your garage turn into a chaotic mess, but it doesn't have to be that way. Here, Marissa shows us a few free and or low cost ideas to help control your space so that you can put the attention where it needs to be on your car. I mean, we're just filling pages and shooting models at this point, aren't we, Super Street? But that's okay, what you got? Organization starts with keeping your tools and supplies from cluttering your garage floor or workspace. Here you'll see some of our power tools, extension cords, and other miscellaneous equipment secured to the wall on hooks. Also, cabinets are an easy install away from storing more tools and supplies. In our case, cleaning products and lubricants. Don't just throw your bolts, nuts, and any other miscellaneous hardware into a bucket. You'll never find the size you need unless you like sifting for hours. Instead, break them all down by size into individual bins C inset. You can find these at most major hardware stores. If you're lucky, you might be able to cash in on Craigslist by finding listings on businesses that are going out of business. I wonder if anybody got lucky on Craigslist and got Super Streets bins back in 2020. If you're tight on space, storage racks are an inexpensive way to keep your spare parts and other household items in check. Pick them up at any major hardware store in a variety of sizes and configurations to suit your needs. We also recommend using plastic storage bins to further organize much like the bins we used for smaller hardware. Your tool cart should start as clear of clutter as possible from the beginning of that day's project. Use a magnetized strip on the side to hang various hand tools like screwdrivers, wrenches, and the like so that you can free the top for sockets and air guns. We have an aired out STI from the looks of it. Stancing with the cars, down on all fours. All wheel drive on air, don't care. Words by Sam Dew, photos by Jeremy Allen Glover. 
Stop shaking your head. Yeah, we're talking to you. Yeah, we're stalking to you. Although this is a STI spilt for stance, there's a reason this Subi caught our attention. It looks so friggin' mean. The owner is Tyler Williams, a 22-year-old college student from Montreal. He's also a professional CrossFit trainer, so while we don't want to offend Tyler because he could probably kick our ass, we had to ask the question why he went this direction with a car rooted heavily in rally racing and all-wheel drive performance. I outgrew the whole speed thing, he told us. Huh? So what did you drive before? My dad has owned a performance parts shop for years, but now mostly does detailing. I got into cars this way when I was only 12. I always wanted a Skyline, so I saved up. When I turned 17, I bought my first project, an R32 GTR, one of the first in Quebec, he explained. Because the R32 was a 15-year-old car at the time, Tyler was able to import one hassle-free from Japan in accordance to Canadian law. And as a teenager addicted to speed, the Nissan was rebuilt and tuned to almost 500 wheel horsepower. Rolling on our compounds, it was daily driven and beaten on the track on a monthly basis. But I got tired of driving a 20-year-old car and I needed something more mature and reliable, especially since the winners here are harsh, he continued. With no intention of tracking his future car, Tyler picked up the STI and went with the idea of going low. His days of thunder were over, but that didn't mean it was a bad thing. The owner spent months researching for a suspension setup that would give him the ultimate drop. Eventually, he came across Air Rex through his friends at Memory Fab. Air Rex has become popular in the last two years, offering bag over coil setups with vehicle specific kits such as the STI. I was expecting to do a custom setup, but these fit and work great, he revealed. You'd expect to sacrifice a lot of performance, especially on a Subaru, but the suspension is just as good as the coils I had on the car before I did air. It's really stiff and offers dampening adjustment. The rest of the air hardware came from bag riders, including the tank, valves, manifolds, and management. For Tyler's wheel choice, everything fell into place like butter. The 18x10 work emotions are actually the same rims fitted on his old GTR, but instead of rocking two 75 series tires, he's stretching two 25 rubbers for the perfect fitment. Some simple bolt-ons and a flat black wrap finish the project car. I get a lot of mixed emotions toward this car, but it doesn't phase me, Tyler concluded. Stance isn't for everybody, especially on an all-wheel drive car, but Tyler's justified himself. He's been there and done that, having owned a GTR, and while 99% of Subaru owners wouldn't consider taking this direction with an STI, wouldn't they though? <laughs> and while 99% of Subaru owners wouldn't consider taking this direction with an STI, we give props to Tyler for trying something different and making this car his own. Still have a problem? You can meet him by the freeways, bitch! Reader's Rides, and it's just, it's just a model. There's no Reader's Rides here. We're back with another edition of Reader's Rides. This month, we have a fine batch of cars. So fine, it was too hard to pick our favorite. So you're gonna help us. And that's an ad for their Facebook page, facebook.com slash superstreetmag, and you can help them pick the best car, and maybe they win something, blah, blah, blah. Reader's Rides, Kyle Schaefer. His ride is a 1996 Nissan 240SX uh, with an S14A conversion. Look great. SR swap, Turbonetics T3, top mount, turbo and wastegate, stainless exhaust, manifold, Gretti exhaust, blow off valve and front mount air cooler, Nismo mounts, Brian Crower, 272 degree cams, titanium retainers, up, uprated valve springs, Apexi head gasket and SAFC, ARP head and main studs, CP pistons, Eagle rods, Clevite bearings, polished crank, 700cc injectors, Thermal intake gasket, Z32 MAF, Koyo radiator, flex light fans, AEM wideband, NIS2 ECU, HKS turbo timer, Exeti clutch and flywheel, one piece drive shaft, limited slip diff, solid subframe bushings, Walbro fuel pump, KYB GR2 struts, uh, Tyne Springs, Cusco strut bar, Z32 front brake calipers with Brembo rotors, adjustable tension rod, 17 inch Go Zygon wheels, Falcon tires, bright seats, Kooky tail lights! front clip conversion and carbon fiber spoiler, carbon rear spoiler, vertex body kit. Mods that should have been done. Maybe some updated wheels and go a bit lower, but this ride is clean. Bitch, please. Those are dank wheels. They stop making them. Everybody likes FN01 RCs. Try harder, Super Street. Chris Teese drives a 2005 Subaru WRX STI. He's in Tustin, California, and his mods include a Cobb access port and a bunch of bullshit. Mods that should have been done. Blue wheels are still in? Guess so. Antonio Della Merced has a 1995 Mazda Miata in Las Vegas, Nevada. 
Jackson Racing Header, Racing Beat Intake, Magnaflow Exhaust, Coil Radiator, Garage Start Cooling and Radiator Panel, Miata Roadster Short Shift, Raceland Coilovers, Ew, 15x8, 15x8.5, BBS, RM006 Wheels, Falcon Tires Project, G Side Skirts and Rear Wing, Toge Run Front Lip, R Package Rear Lip, Eurospec Rear Panel, Smoked Lights, Runabout Fuel Door, Nardi Torino Steering Wheel. Mods that should have been done. It's a sweet looking Miata, but still not sure if we could ever drive one ourselves. Hey. Fuck you! The quintessential roadster, Super Street. You can't see yourself driving it. Kenny Richardson, Ride 2000 Nissan Silvia Spec S in Okinawa, Japan. Mods done. Fujitsubo, FGK header, Apexi intake, Moonface easy throttle, Go Zygon Pro Racer exhaust, Tyne coilovers, Nismo strut bars, 17x7, 17x8.5, Tech final speed wheels, Kenwood head unit and speakers, Fusion amp and subs. Mazda should have been done. Ship it to our office. This is just begging for more. They like that one. Ronald Vasquez in a 2008 Mitsubishi Evo 10 in Boston, Mass. Engine intake and intercooler pipe, CNT exhaust, test pipe and downpipe, KW coilovers, 19 by 10 and a half CCW SP16R wheels, Nitto Invo tires, Saibon carbon trunk and rear diffuser, AIT side skirts, JDP front lip, ride Stradia seats, Sparco harness bar, Takata harnesses, Takata harnesses, excuse me. <clears throat> Nardi steering wheel, works bell hub, flipper and quick release, TWM short shifter and bushing. Mods that should have been done. Got all the bolt-ons down, but now it's time to start adding power. Seth Ullman is right. Is a 2006 Subaru WRX STI in the Hawkeye. I love a bug eye. I like a Hawkeye. They're fine. They're fine. NVIDIA N1 race exhaust downpipe, Tomei header and up pipe, cob access port and heat shield, grim speed, electronic boost solenoid and TGV deletes, synchronic diverter valve, Samco turbo inlet and air cooler hose kit, Walbro fuel pump, k and Typhoon intake, Deechworks 850cc injectors, 18x9.5 Rota G-Force wheels, Hawk HPS pads, DBA slotted rotors, Goodridge brake lines, white line sway bars, mounts, bushings, anti-lift kit and adjustable in links, BC RAM coilovers, cart boy, short shifter and bushings. Mods that should have been done. Your car is very black. Okay. Um, I, I don't, I don't. I'm not nah. quite... Calendar, plan your month. We got... Well, what we got coming up? Well, in August, we have Spocom in Anaheim, the infamous, prevented by Cannabeat and Hella Flush at Queen Mary, Long Beach, California. Then we have the Nisei Show-Off in Little Tokyo, Formula D at Las Vegas Motor Speedway, Import Face-Off at Capital Raceway in Crofton, Maryland, and then Weekfest New Jersey at the New Jersey Convention and Expo Center. Moving on into the end of August and September, we have 2012 Formula One Shell Belgian Grand Prix at Circuit de Spa, Frank or Champs... Franker champs? I don't know, man. Disclaimer, double check all the dates before attempting to participate in any of these events. You can't believe everything you read online, but we sure can print them. Back in the day, this is typically, when I used to read Super Street all the time, back in the day was usually my favorite. It was always a feature of something classic and nice, usually like a Skyline or a S30 or something cool. Swede for speed. Is that a Volvo wagon? Damn straight, and it has 600 horsepower. Words by Sam Dew, photos by Max Erie. Typically in this section, we'd be pleasuring you with Hakusukas, 88.6s, Xelicas, and Corollas, but this month we're inspired by something Swedish. We wish it was during a massage, but it happened over drinks one night. We were debating over the best Euros and wagons ever built. The only car we could all agree on was this spectacular 69 Volvo 122 Amazon wagon. While this wagon is a stranger to 99% of you, those who frequented the SEMA show might remember it. In 2006, the 122 Amazon was selected as Sweden's hottest Volvo. The prize? A round trip ticket for the owner and his car to display in the Volvo booth. Thousands of people, including us, were tripping balls because we had never seen a project done as flawless as this, let alone an old Volvo. It was home built from scratch and incorporated modern tuning and styling while still maintaining its old school swag. The owner isn't whom you'd expect either. At the time the owner completed the project, Matthias Volks was only 26 years old. In our 20s, we were still chasing girls and partying every other night. Wait, we're still doing that? <laughs> But Matthias spent every weekend and night for six straight years putting together this wagon. Oh, and we almost forgot his day job, too. He's a mechanic and engineer for supercar maker Koenigsegg. Okay, so it's exactly who you'd fucking expect, isn't it? Well, that's okay. That's okay. You might think these headers were professionally done, but the owner takes cred. Bro, 
I think if you're a mechanic and engineer for Koenigsegg, that counts as professional. <laughs> but back to the wagon. You won't find an inch of the car that's not modified. To start, the fenders and front and rear panels were extended two inches closer to the ground using sheet metal. This also lined up the exterior with custom side skirts. As for the arches, they were pulled and raised an inch to accommodate the 19-inch BBS LMs. The doors came next. This wagon would traditionally seat five comfortably, but Matthias shaved the rear doors and reworked the frame for larger Volvo Coupe front doors. A few other magical touches include the trunk, which features a custom plate recess. We also can't forget the exit for the side exhaust and relocated fuel door. It's above the bloody C-pillar. It's above the C-pillar? Do they have a photo of that? I don't think they include a photo of the gas lid, but apparently it's on the roof. Um, that's an interesting choice. Bottom left, you can see the piping. 11-point roll cage with a fuel cell in the back, and also check out the plumbing leading to the roof-mounted fuel door. I eat Supras for breakfast. As for the motor and 80 horsepower, four-cylinder was enough juice back in the day when the Amazon wagon was put on dealer lots, but Matthias's goal was more than six times this, so he sourced a 2.5-liter six-cylinder from a Volvo 960. Before dropping it in, he bored and stroked it to 2.8, adding new rods, pistons, and crank. Then months were spent handcrafting the perfect manifold and exhaust, followed by porting the custom head and developing a long-runner intake plenum. With a massive GT4088 turbo bolted on, the moment of time came to squeeze the motor on into the bay. Mind you, this wasn't going to be as easy as dropping a K-Series into Civic. This job was completely one-off and it required the firewall to be pushed back 8 inches. The motor was then mounted at an angle. Tuned to a tad over 600 horsepower, it was just enough muscle to oust Matthias's favorite opponent. Supras! Of course, the monster needed a buff drivetrain to handle that much abuse. Nothing straight out of the Volvo parts been worked, so Matthias welded a newer 960 front housing together with a Supra 5-speed gearbox. Ironically, the car he wants to beat the most. More reinforcements came from a BMW M5 clutch, custom drive shaft, and upgraded axles. A custom 4-link suspension was designed for the chassis using Suzuki dampers on custom coilovers. And for stopping power, Matthias was able to smuggle some parts out of his office and installed Koenigsegg rotors and calipers all around. These parts alone are probably worth more than the cars we drive. Just when you thought there couldn't be anything else, we see the interior. A pair of Sparco seats were custom trimmed in rich red leather, along with every other panel, carpet, and accent in the cockpit. And since the rear doors were shaved, the seats weren't needed. Now you'll find an intricate 11-point roll cage, fuel cell, and a Lexan floor revealing the tranny case steering rack and chassis. Wild. Truth be told, the wagon stomps on 99% of... They've been using 99% in this magazine a lot. I think I've read that at least a half dozen times. This is like during the Occupy Wall Street era, and I wonder if we are the 99% got stuck in Sam Dew's head. Because seriously, it's, it's all over this issue. <laughs> Truth be told, the wagon stomps on 99% of the so-called project we've seen in our lifetime. From every panel to nut and bolt, Matthias sacrificed his early to mid-twenties creating this work of art. It's undoubtedly one of the hottest Euros and wagons to ever grace the planet, which is why we're giving it a big Super Street salute. Very cool. Amazons are dope, and this is probably the only one that's ever been featured in an issue of Super Street, uh, so pretty cool. And it's the end, guys. Happy ending. Breathe and stop. Toshiki Toshiking Yoshioka, driver for Team Retax for the 2012 Formula D season, takes a moment to relax in between competition rounds at the Long Beach opener. And then add for TSW wheels next to him. And that's it. Back page is an ad for General Tires. Gross. Yeah, that's going to wrap it up, guys. CollectorCarFeed.com, check it out. Uh, click whatever's on your screen right now for more content if you need it. I'm sure this video is well over an hour long, um, so you probably want to break. But if you don't, click something, brother. We got you covered. And I would be remiss to not mention Patreon.com slash CollectorCarFeed, where you can get even more video content, extra clips from our live streams, that kind of thing. Uh, if you want stickers like the ones shown here on this makeshift, magazine rack. These are all available to you on patreon.com slash collector car feed, so go check it out. Collector car feed, now with over 6,100 subscribers. 